Hey there, cool cats and kittens. Sorry, always wanted to say that. Welcome back to Forensic Therapist Explains. Today we're going to be breaking down narcissism. What is narcissism? What does it look like? Why does it work? And what can we do about it? I'll be doing all of this by combining both research and pop culture. I'll be breaking down a 2020 literature review on narcissism by Maria Costanea in the science of psychotherapy. I'll be explaining it using some of my favorite shows like Bojack Horseman, Rick and Morty, Archer, and the unbelievable Netflix documentary Tiger King. I'll also provide what the article tells us about why people fall for narcissistic behavior and what we can do to guard against it. Finally, we'll end with another mini episode of Donald Trump forcibly goes to therapy. This is where I take something that Donald Trump has done that displays the behavior we're talking about and respond to it directly. When I saw his recent meltdown at the White House press conference, I couldn't help but think that this was a perfect example of narcissism. My hope is by showing how one could respond in pretty much the most extreme situation possible, it could provide a template for people to use on smaller situations that might feel less threatening. Please don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel to get more videos like this one. Do you think I'm a good person deep down? That's the thing. I don't think I believe in deep down. I kind of think all you are is just the things that you do. Well, that's depressing. <laughs> I'm going to start with this quote directly from the paper, which describes narcissism as a psychological attitude that can exist on the spectrum of normal. Narcissism should be seen as a combination of traits, thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that function on a spectrum from normal to pathological or unhealthy. I want to be clear, in this video I am not diagnosing anybody with narcissistic personality disorder. You do not need to meet criteria for NPD to display narcissistic traits to do narcissistic things, or to think narcissistic thoughts. In fact, as I'll show in this video, narcissism is everywhere. Some of our most popular television shows, movies, celebrities, even, especially, our president, all display narcissistic traits. By breaking down the patterns of behavior we've learned about narcissism in psychology, you'll come away from this video with a better understanding of how to recognize these behaviors and traits in yourself and others, as well as strategies to combat them. Let me briefly introduce you to this video's article. I picked this article because it was written by a professional clinician, so somebody who's going to have both real-world experience as well as an understanding of research. It wasn't published in what I would necessarily consider a peer-reviewed journal, but there is some review process that I can tell. The magazine appears to have the aim of bridging the gap between theoretical research and the real world. Seems like a good aim to me. So the other thing that I really liked about this article is that it's a combination research design. On one hand, it's a literature review. A literature review is when you go back in the research and try to figure out everything that we've learned about this subject. It's also a stakeholder analysis, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. For now, let's look at the traits that they found in the article. I've chosen these seven traits because I think they cover the wide spectrum of what narcissistic behavior really looks like. So I titled this section Sex Stuff because I want to talk about criminal sexual behavior, but I don't want to talk about that exclusively. As you've probably guessed, Things like lack of empathy and selective information processing are pretty much a recipe for coercive or criminal sexual behavior. But other traits influence sexuality as well. For example, grandiosity. For some people, grandiosity can be related to promiscuity, especially if the number of sexual partners they have is in some way related to status in their mind. There's also what I'm going to loosely call sex as coping. Excuse me. I just wanted you to know that you ruined someone else's night tonight. And I hope you have enough decency to at least feel a little bit crappy about it. 
Excuse me? I was actually already in a bad mood, but I thought maybe for one night I could go out to a bar and try to forget about myself. But now, because of you and your friends, I feel more self-conscious than ever. Maybe because you're skinny, and maybe because you're pretty, you're used to getting away with things. But I want you to know that your actions have an effect on others, and I hate you, and you are a horrible person, and- Five minutes later. Well, that was another in a long series of regrettable life choices. What'd you say? I was tweeting about all the weird stuff you do in bed. Which can help someone rebound out of a depressive state. The internal logic for that tends to be, I feel like a piece of shit, so if I go out and have sex with somebody, then at least for that little while, I won't feel like a piece of shit. And since that person had sex with me, then that's at least proof that one person doesn't think that I'm a piece of shit, or else they wouldn't have had sex with me. It seems like that's what's happening with Bojack here. Also, if you want to see an episode on sex as coping exclusively, please comment below. This is a super interesting topic, and I can go on and on about it. I promise I won't, though, like I did in that gaslighting video. Sorry. In the simplest terms, grandiosity is thinking that you're the best when, in reality, you're a human being like everybody else. Rick Sanchez's tagline is smartest man in the universe. Rick Sanchez, everyone. Smartest man in the universe. By definition, that's grandiosity. Just like the therapist he visits, I'm going to take his intellectual prowess as fact. This fact does not negate the fundamental truth that Rick is still a human being. He's trying to make sense of the world and his own innate capabilities as well as his contradictory experiences, just like everybody else. As the therapist points out, you seem to alternate between viewing your own mind as an unstoppable force and as an inescapable curse. You are the master of your universe, and yet you are dripping with rat blood and feces, your enormous mind literally vegetating by your own hand. I realize that some might argue that Rick has a right to be grandiose. Guess who just discovered a new element? You think you could do that, Morty? You think anyone but me could do that ever in a billion years? Do you think if God existed, he could do it? The answer is no. If God exists, it's f***ing me. To which I counter, how well is being grandiose actually serving him? Like, what does it mean to Rick to be the smartest man in the universe? His intelligence is known to pretty much everyone. So why does he still feel the need to do stupid shit like turn himself into a pickle when he has nothing to prove? What does Rick's idea of the happiest man in the universe look like? And would that even be an achievable goal for him? If not, what would the point of being the smartest man in the universe be? Thinking about it, would doofus Rick actually be the happiest man in the universe if the other Rick stopped picking on him? Lack of empathy is something that stuck out to me really profoundly while watching Tiger King. Pretty much the entire cast of characters is completely devoid of basic empathy for both human beings and animals. I'm gonna hone in specifically on Joe though, just because he's so obvious about it. Let's just watch this clip for a second. Hey, I'm gonna show people how fucking crazy I am, run! I don't wanna be the <laughs> best <laughs> <laughs> And this is my mother-in-law, run! <laughs> Stand right there. No! Stay! Stay! Right there! Don't move! No, no, no! Do you have any water What the fuck are you doing? So yeah. I picked this clip for two reasons. One, it's horrifying, and two, everybody's laughing. I wanted to do this to point out the fact that those two things are not mutually exclusive. Oftentimes, people laugh when they feel really uncomfortable or nervous. Also, there's some environments that are just so chaotic and traumatizing that laughter becomes an effective coping mechanism to deal with the absurdity. So I wanted to make it really clear, starting from the get-go, that just because somebody is laughing doesn't mean that what is happening isn't horrifying. And what is happening in that clip is 
horrifying. Just to break it down really quick, first of all, guns are tools that are meant to kill. You should never point or pull the trigger towards a living creature without lethal intent. When you start discharging your weapon for random reasons that aren't lethal, you create a culture of reckless gun use. We can see very clearly that that type of culture has been created. And unfortunately, reckless gun use leads to death. Furthermore, shooting at your unarmed, defenseless, not hurting you in any way family member is not appropriate. Doing that to an employee is not appropriate. And doing it because you think someone is disloyal is cuckoo bananas. No, none of that is okay. All of that is horrific. Joe does all of this with seemingly zero concern for the health, safety, or well-being for his employees, which again, some are his family. And yeah, I can't even get into this stuff with the cats or else I'll have a damn aneurysm. Like, no, you can't treat animals that way. Or people, no, no. Sometimes people are surprised when I say that there's a link between depression and narcissism. My intention in saying that isn't to denigrate anybody who has depression. Rather, I'm pointing out a correlation, not a causation. So if you think about it, most depressive thoughts are really self-focused about how crappy you feel, how crappy it is to be you, how much of a piece of shit you are. And often, People who are really depressed can get into this mindset where they feel like they don't have any energy to deal with anyone besides themselves. Sometimes this can lead to things like inhibition, social withdrawal, negative self-talk, and a hypersensitivity to negative feedback. Now, this can turn narcissistic when it becomes what I'm going to call a narcissistic feedback loop. What that is, is when the low feelings are so terrible the person has to do something really drastic and narcissistic in order to pull themselves out of it. This is what we see happening in Bojack. A stupid piece of shit. But I know I'm a piece of shit. That at least makes me better than all the pieces of shit who don't know they're pieces of shit. Or is it worse? Breakfast. Oh, well, what are they talking about right now? Probably you and what a dumb piece of trash you are, you fat sack of idiot. Why don't you do the world a favor and swerve into oncoming traffic? No, you don't deserve to die young. Only the greats die young. Oh, now you think you're young all of a sudden. One drink. <laughs> Idiot. What'd you do all day, piece of shit? That's a day you'll never get back. What was that? You're a real... He tries to get rid of his depressive thoughts and feelings through alcohol and avoidance, which doesn't work very well. In fact, Doing that reinforces his own internal narrative about how much of a piece of shit he is. Violent lashing out over seemingly small behaviors is another narcissistic behavior. I'm going to use Mallory Archer as an example here because I'm going to use Sterling Archer as an example later. Get to Odin! I will! Keycard? Oh, here! God! They are the stuff throwing his family. Okay, so... F I call your vase guy. Freeze every one of his accounts. And idiots surrounded by nothing but... What the hell is your problem? Finding your replacement, Missy, if you don't watch your tone. And be, be careful, you big lumox. I swear to God, if you scuff my bag, me. and if I wanted to sit around all day going nowhere, I'd be a teacher. Oh, shut up. I bet you're barren. Hello, mother. Where the hell have you been? It's important to note that narcissistic behavior patterns are often passed down in families. If you grew up in a household where mom freaks out over these little things, you're going to think that's normal. And it's going to take some awareness and effort to get rid of that normalization and come up with better behavior patterns when you're an adult. Narcissistic manipulation in relationships is a really complex topic. I'm going to try to give a broad overview using Doc Antle from Tiger King as an example. The first thing that stuck out to me about him is that he chose not one, but two names that denote authority, Doc and Bhagavan. 
This automatically creates an uneven power dynamic between him and anyone he's in a relationship with. He has put himself up as the leader, the expert, the spiritual guide, the one who knows more. That type of thinking is pointed out clearly by the woman who left. This is me when I first got there. What do you choose to call him Bhagavan? Is that how everyone? That's what we called him. Bhagavan, which means what? Lord. It means Lord. You can see that incredibly clearly in the show with Doc Antle. The relationship requires a commitment that is entirely focused on creating his little world, his zoo, everything about him. That only makes sense with narcissistic logic. In a healthy relationship, there's give and take. Not one person being a dictator or a director of the other person's life to the point of pressuring them into getting plastic surgery. I feel like it's even more obvious in this case because there's such a double standard at play. He's doing this to multiple women, none of whom seem to have any life outside of him and running his little zoo. This the women he's with don't seem to be allowed to have any real companionship or relationships outside of him, and there's really no way that their needs could be met. Their needs don't seem to be considered at all, and I wasn't surprised by the resentful tone in his son's voice. All-knowing, all-seeing kind of guy. To me, that sounds like somebody who knows that his dad completely took advantage of his mom and is not happy about it. Information processing is how we make sense of the world around us. How we use our senses to create a story in our head to explain what's happening. Everybody processes information a little bit differently, and there's no real right or wrong way. However, there's some ways that are not as helpful if they're not used properly. The narcissistic way of processing information is selective. It tunes out things related to other people and tunes in things related to you. I don't care if you're Captain... Crunch. No, wait. Beefheart. Claudio, we had a deal. No, wait. Kangaroo. And we pointed out every Remember single him? flaw in your cut rate security system. And now, not only are you hiring another agency, there was a Captain you won't Kangaroo. even pay ISIS for that security probe. Which means no bonuses Kangaroo. for us. Wait, what? Oh, now he cares. What the shit, Lana? I told you I was gonna do it. Right, sorry. Guess I'm a bad listener. Obviously! This ties into the lack of empathy thing I was talking about earlier. Obviously, it's kind of hard to have empathy for people if you aren't really paying attention to them. It's also important to note that the narcissistic information processing is paying attention to both positive and negative feedback. You might think if somebody was already selectively processing, they might as well just tune out the negative as well. However, this doesn't take into account the depressive narcissistic feedback loop we were talking about earlier, and as was shown in Bojack. It's often this period of deep depression that springboards somebody into narcissistic behavior. So the hyper-focus on negative feedback can turn into hyper-focus on positive feedback to quell that person's ego. So why is this effective? In order to answer the question of why narcissistic behaviors work, we need to go back to the other part of the research design I was talking about earlier, stakeholder analysis. Stakeholder analysis is when researchers seek out information from people who have experienced the phenomenon in real life. This can be a bit more creative than traditional ways of seeking out information and can include things like looking through message boards, subreddits, TED Talks, speaking with activists, and clinicians. These are all things that the author did in this case. From this information, combined with the literature review, I'm gonna go over some of the reasons why people fall for narcissistic behavior. Going off the narcissistic behaviors I just described, you might think that if you had somebody in your life who was doing those things, you'd probably cut them out pretty quickly. But, as I also showed, that type of behavior is all over our pop culture. So, why do we keep watching? There are three specific things the article pointed out. Love bombing, trauma bonding, and targeted victims. Love bombing is when someone showers you with overwhelming praise. You're the most beautiful, you're the most amazing, no one has ever made me feel like this before. I don't know what I would ever do without you. You're just so perfect and talented. On some level that feels good, right? 
even if it's over the top and we doubt that it's true, it still feels kind of good. It can be an ego boost. And then when that isn't there, it can create a vacuum. People who have survived narcissistic relationship abuse sometimes describe it like an adrenaline withdrawal. Once you get used to being spoken to like that, it can be extremely distressing when that goes away. You start to question your positive qualities, whether or not that person meant that thing before, and you do whatever you can to get back in that person's good graces so you can start receiving that positive feedback again. This brings us to trauma bonding. Again, I think Tiger King provides us with the best example here. I just kind of felt like I was attached by pain to Joe. Like we had a bond of pain and I couldn't leave him because of course I wanted to leave. You know, why do I want to come back to the office every day that, you know, a horrific accident happened? So being in a really highly narcissistic environment can sometimes mean being around a lot of incredible things. So these environments, these little worlds, can be really easy to get sucked into and really difficult to disconnect from. It could feel like nothing else could live up to that environment, or you've been so normalized to it that you just can't imagine yourself anywhere else. When I say targeted victims, what I mean is that people with more vulnerabilities tend to be targeted by people who use a lot of narcissistic behavior. Like Joe Exotic said, he's not stupid. People who use these behaviors a lot figure out who they work well on and who they don't. You see clearly that Joe chooses people to be around who feel indebted to him. If a person without anywhere else to go gets in a narcissistic relationship or environment, it's going to be difficult for them to leave. I'm also going to put forward another reason that I've personally noticed as a clinician, but that wasn't included in the article. In my experience, most survivors tend to be people who are either unaware or somehow believe they are immune to criminal thinking behaviors and patterns. By that I mean, typically the survivor is giving the perpetrator the benefit of the doubt when the perpetrator isn't doing the same. Most survivors want to see the good in people and they often truly believe that the perpetrator was operating within the same moral framework that they were. Unfortunately, in my experience, that's never the reality of the situation. If you're being hurt by narcissistic behaviors, that person is essentially playing dirty and they're displaying behaviors that they wouldn't tolerate from somebody else. So what do you do if you're in this situation? What do you do if you have somebody in your life or you know that you're going to be around somebody who uses a lot of narcissistic behavior patterns. I'm going to teach you a really simple technique called the gray rock method. In order to understand why this method works, I want you to take a step back and think about all of those narcissistic traits and behaviors we talked about earlier. Put yourself in the mindset of somebody using those narcissistic traits and behaviors. Are you there? Okay. We're going to do a little experiment. In your narcissistic mindset, you're walking down the road and you see this rock. We'll call him Rock A. Right next to it, you see this rock. We'll call this guy Rock B. In your narcissistic mindset, which one do you choose? Let us know below in the comments which one you chose and why. When I put myself in the narcissistic mindset, I choose this one, Rock B because it's flashy, it's pretty, I could put it in my office, I could brag about it, I could display it in my home, it's cool and interesting like me, so I'm gonna grab this one. I can just take it and do with it what I want. My narcissistic mindset wasn't really interested in picking up rock A. I mean, this is just a boring gray rock, right? Now, let's get out of that narcissistic mindset, come back to collective reality, and see what the lesson was here. If you didn't catch it, this actually isn't a rock at all. They're rocks, Hank! No, they're minerals! Jesus, Marie, I got some geodes coming that are very delicate, all right? I was showing two sides of the same geode. Some people think that the gray rock method means changing yourself, when really it just means showing the side of you that is most protected. In the simplest of terms, it means 
be boring. So you won't be an interesting target. And that's the gray rock method. So to bring it all the way back to the beginning, why do you think I started with that clip from Bojack Horseman? The one where she's saying, all you are is what you do. Leave a comment below on how you think that philosophy applies to narcissism as we've talked about in this video. I picked it because I hope that it would plant a seed. Plant a seed of thinking of behaviors over labels of a person. Even if somebody has diagnosable narcissistic personality disorder, that's not the only thing that they are. They're complex, three-dimensional human beings, just like you, me, and everybody else. This guide is meant to categorize and understand behaviors, not human beings. And they are behaviors we engage in all the time. Clearly, having a YouTube channel where I'm prominently showing my face, using my name, putting out my opinions, is by definition narcissistic. No shit, Sherlock. I think it's important to recognize and own up to those behaviors so that we're using it in places that we want to be and not in places where we don't want to be. To recap, narcissistic behaviors come in many forms. We talked about seven specific traits that were put forth in a 2020 literature review in the science of psychotherapy. These were sexual behaviors, which range from an unhealthy and excessive need to straight up criminal behaviors, grandiosity, or the belief that you're greater than other human beings to an extreme degree, lack of empathy or care for other people or animals, Periods of deep depression, which can then cycle into periods of grandiosity, periods of violence, either physical or emotional, typically in the form of over-the-top outbursts. Manipulation in relationships in order to maintain control over the other person. And selective information processing to things related to them, both positive and negative. These things work because some narcissistic behaviors feel really good. We can get trapped in a cycle of craving the positive attention from a love bomb that we ignore or tolerate the violence. Trauma bonding is also extremely effective in keeping people in situations that are harmful. In addition, people with vulnerabilities may be more likely to be targeted in the first place. My personal professional advice is that one-sided relationships are pretty much never healthy and seeing the best in people isn't always warranted. The other piece of advice I hope you take from this video is the gray rock method. It was mentioned in the paper and it's something that I've used personally. I found being boring to be a shockingly effective technique in staving off somebody's wrath, staying off of somebody's shit list. So I wanna start off by saying that in my opinion, the way that the reporters Ms. Tiong and Ms. Collins handled this was perfect. Um, I think any comments that I'm making are really Monday morning quarterbacking, and so I want to acknowledge that. And please do not take anything that I'm saying as uh, saying that they did anything wrong. In fact, I'm just going to offer some ways of how they could have maybe gone further. Um, and expand on sort of what the line of questioning I think they were going for. It seems like America's ranking in terms of testing compared to other countries is really important to you. Why is that meaningful? And maybe that's a question you should ask China. China. Ah, uh, China. Ah, uh, China. Ah, uh, China. Uh. Why did you bring up China when speaking with an Asian American reporter? What, sir, why are you saying that to me specifically? I'm telling you, I'm not saying it specifically to anybody. I'm saying it to anybody that would ask a nasty question That's like that. That's not a nasty. If you're going to leave the session early, it's going to be a hundred dollar fee and that's not payable by your insurance. That's straight out of pocket. Just so you know. 
Thank you for checking out this episode of Forensic Therapist Explained, where we took a deep dive into narcissism. Be sure to click subscribe, like this video and channel, and be sure to hit the button to get notifications for when we post new videos.